Welcome to everybody to Harmony Landing and uh, we appreciate everybody that, that came here and don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of the staff uh, if you need anything this week and kudos to Ryan and all his team with the AJGA and uh, Andy and his staff in the golf shop and uh, Russ and his staff over at the clubhouse. It's a group effort and last but not least uh, a huge thank you to all of our sponsors which make all this possible and we're going to continue to try to elevate uh, this tournament to the highest level and it's not possible with this without the sponsors many of the sponsors are here today and i can't uh, say thank you enough for what you all have done to help make this event what it is so really i don't know if you will have an opening statement but we really want to do a Q&A here so you know don't be bashful if you have something that you want to ask if we're uh, allowed to answer it we will <laughs> yeah th thank you all for being here like my dad said um, there's a lot of people that would love to individually thank each and every one of you it, it means a lot uh, and I'm very very fortunate in the schedule wise that I'm able to come here and see all of you face to face um, you know this place in the, in the and the AJGA has a very special place in my heart. I uh, obviously grew up playing the AJGA, spent a lot of a lot of hours on this range in this facility. So to watch you all experience um, you know this place and be here, a place that I love and and has gotten me to where I am today, means a lot and and hopefully will inspire some of you to you know do a lot bigger and better things outside the game of golf. So you can you know one day have uh maybe have an event of your own but yeah like my dad said feel free to to ask any questions and uh yeah i mean you got us on an open mic so may as well take advantage of it all right thank you everybody. yeah that was great thanks <laughs> yes justin when you had your first hole in one on 16 how old were you and what club did you hit uh my first hole in one on 16 i was six years old i think it was 140 40, 145 yards, and it was everything I had of a driver. <laughs> was your dad with you? He was, I think. I was six. I don't remember much. <laughs> what is uh, your most favorite course you've ever played? Favorite course I've ever played is probably... Um, I like I like the courses in the UK. I mean, Roll County Down in Ireland. I mean, St Andrews is. Those are if if I had a you know one round left, barring any bad weather, that's I'd be playing some kind of place over there. I mean, I, I love love Augusta and love a lot of places we play in the states. But just the the uniqueness and the creativity you have to have to play those golf courses, um, it just really isn't something you can emulate over here. So I, I love golf over there. Mm -hmm. Tell the putter story uh, that got a lot of talk a couple years ago as far as uh, switching putters. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I came out here, was just walking around with the, you know, or riding around the Junior Am and just saying hey to some people. And um, yeah, at the time I wasn't using my putter. Uh, the, the putter that Scotty Cameron luckily had, had created, the Justin Thomas putter. And had a lot of success with it and uh, just straight up got called out by one of the juniors in the tournament um, about not uh, not using it and, and asked why I wasn't using it if it was my putter. So had a nice little slice of humble pie from him and um, then switched to it that next week. So thank you. For sure. I mean, college golf is, it's, uh, I mean, first off, I was talking to a couple of girls earlier at lunch. I mean, college is supposed to be some of the best time of your life. I mean, it's, you know, I feel like every age group you get to, you think it's the hardest it gets. But in reality, being fortunate enough to play a sport in college, um, it's, it's about as cool as it gets and as good as it gets. And for me, I was very, very lucky to have a great relationship with my teammates. And, and that was that was something that we cherished and we pushed each other a lot. So I think 
you obviously want to hold each other accountable to where you're there to try to, at least for myself in college, I was trying to get myself and my game as ready as possible to play at the next level, to play at the professional level. So that was, I don't want to say selfishly my number one priority, but it was definitely up there in terms of, of what I was thinking of. Um, but the team aspect and getting to share those memories and those moments with my teammates uh, who are now still some of my best friends was, was something I definitely can't replace or, or, or couldn't take advantage of. And, you know, we were able to, I, I'm a big question asker. I like to, you know, whether it's someone at a higher level than me, lower level than me, if I feel like they have something that I could learn from, I'm going to ask them a question. Or maybe if they can hit a shot that I can't hit, I'm going to ask them how they can hit it. And you don't necessarily have to take it in. If it works for you, great. If not, then you just move on. But for me, I used my teammates who were very, very good players around me and tried to use them to better myself and better my game. And I think we all did that, and we all kind of pushed each other to another level. So I think that's something that a lot of y'all can do if going on to that next level and playing college is, um, you know, try to make the most of it. But first and, for, first and foremost, enjoy it because it's, uh, it's a great time. And uh, obviously, you're all of our favorites. We always pick you in all of our pools. <laughs> Sometimes win some money. And, and uh, I was just thinking, you know, if anyone's going to be six back, I want it to be you. Because you just got this incredible way of saying, I just got to do this, and you do. So I'm curious how your relationship with Tiger has helped you with that. And it seems like you're more encouraging him now than he was encouraging you. It may seem like that, but I, I would definitely say he's encouraged me more than I've encouraged him. Um, it's, I mean, I, uh, some of it definitely has to do with him, but a lot of it is just really experience and just learning and going through um, failures, to be honest. And that's something that I say a lot. And I would say to every junior or even adult, whatever, that doesn't take this into their life is if you're not failing, you're not learning. And then if you... If you get done with a, with a bad round or a bad day or, or bad experience, and there's one of two ways to look at it. And it took me a while to realize this. A lot of it is maturing, but you should be able to take that moment and use it as a positive and say, all right, what did I do wrong in this moment? When was it? Was it something I was thinking? Was it, was it an emotional decision? Was it a physical decision? Um, and what was it? And then from there, you're able to know when you're in that same exact position the next time you're going to improve from it. You're going to be better. And that's the kind of stuff that I've learned internally is that I've I put myself in that spot of being five and six back in tournaments before, and I feel like I have to shoot seven, eight under on the final day or the last nine, when in reality, you know, I was seven back to start Sunday at the PGA Championship. And, I mean, you would think I'd have to shoot nine or ten under, and I shot three, and I was in a playoff. So it's just learning and, and understanding that no matter if it's, good or a bad day on the golf course or in life you can take something positive from it and learn from it because even if it was you go out and shoot 76 I have the potential to learn from that maybe more than if I went out and shot 66 to where I'll be better in the long run from it so really just t taking each and every day for what it is and learning from it to then become not only a better person but a better player or whatever it is you're doing I love uh, Coach Saban's, uh, what's his saying, never waste a failure? Uh, no, MJ says, yeah, if you're not failing, you're not learning. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, that's a very, very true statement. It is. doesn't seem like it when you're failing and very angry, but, um, <laughs> you know, maybe it took 28 or 9 years for me to realize that, but I'm glad I did. Those are two very good questions. I think the most important thing is that there's no one right answer for everybody. Otherwise, it would be easy. Um, I think the biggest thing that I, it took me a little bit to learn, but that nervous is, a, if you're nervous, it's a good thing. Like, don't shy away from being nervous. If, if you're doing something that doesn't make you nervous, you're probably not doing the right thing because it means something to you if you're nervous. I mean, when I tee it up in a golf tournament, when I, when I have a putt on the 16, 17, 18th hole of a weekend and, like, it means something to me, that's good. You know, I, I, I shouldn't be doing it if I'm out there and if I miss, 
it doesn't matter. I move on with my life. That's then I should probably be looking for another job. So embrace that challenge, embrace that nervousness, and really just look at it as an opportunity to showcase your skills and showcase what you have and and just relish and enjoy that moment. Um, and routine wise, everybody's different. I mean, for me, I definitely have a set routine that I do. Um, I mean, I can I can kind of do like some, some different breathing techniques that I know work for me that can kind of calm my heart rate down or, or sometimes the opposite of kind of get me going and getting me into it a little bit more, but everybody plays at different levels. I mean, um, you know, say like, I, poor guy I'm going to pick on him but like you know a Jordan Spieth who's just constantly jittery and going all over the place and talking a lot it's going to be a lot different than a Patrick Cantlay who is just very here the whole time you know and it's it's everybody's different but both of those guys have made have perf not perfected but have continued to try to perfect what they do best and I think the the sooner that all of y'all uh, kids can learn what is your what is in your best interest and what routines or or thoughts produce your best golf or best life decisions whatever it is then that's the routine that i would stick with and do because that's that's what brings the best out in you I haven't really gotten any good advice from my dad, honestly. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, uh, I mean, honestly, both of my parents in instilled it in me is just to enjoy what you're doing and have fun. I know it's very cliche, but they always preached on me that I had to enjoy what I was doing, uh, whether it was golf or another sport or, or a desk job or whatever it was. If uh, It's kind of like I was saying about being nervous. Like, if I didn't enjoy it, then I didn't need to be doing it. Um, and I'm very fortunate that I love and enjoy the grind of what I do. And um, I was really bad at all the other sports, and I wanted to play sports, so golf was my uh, pretty much my only option there. Yeah, I, I guess in a related question, uh, I can remember the first time uh, my son beat me in the backyard playing basketball because he went on to play in the NBA. Mm -hmm. uh, can you remember the first time you beat your dad and what was the reaction to that? <laughs> It's it's pretty embarrassing that neither one of either he's lying or neither one of us remember it. I don't I don't know why we don't, but um, he'd be the first to tell you that when it happened, it, it, it stopped happening the other way. As soon as I beat him, it pretty much kept going that way for until now kind of thing. So <laughs> I don't know when it was, but um, it took me a while, and he got in my head more than anybody, and I was glad to uh, overcome that barrier because it was a tough one for me. Um, yeah, I mean, my mentality that I always try to tell people, like when the media asks us that question, is I'm his friend first, and I'm his coach second, and I'm his father third. And, and I've kind of always tried to, to live by that because I wanted to be his friend, meaning that he wanted to spend time around me. And then as a coach, you know, I wanted him to be comfortable uh, to be able to take you know helps swing help or practice help for me and obviously as he ages i have to be less less of a parent but i mean obviously there were parenting times at a young age but i've just we're very fortunate that we have the relationship that we have um we're very blessed for that and i think it's rooted in the fact that you know i'm his friend first and his coach second and, and his father third Yeah, it was it was a, a really good best available was for sure. But uh, now I I've always respected Bones and just loved how he went about his his way in his business. I mean, he works extremely hard, which is something I I respect a lot. I mean, I I, I kind of look at it, it. I mean, I, I view golf as a big team thing, and and as you get higher and higher levels, your team obviously gets bigger or as small as you want, but. You know, my dad's a part of my team as my coach, and then you have your putting coach, you have your physio, you have your caddy, and it's it's. I expect, just like I expect to go to a tournament prepared, 
as much as I can, I expect my dad to do everything that he can and should do as a coach. And I expect the same out of my trainer and my physio, but also my caddy. So I don't want us to be out there and run into a situation where maybe he isn't prepared or he doesn't have something that he should that could help us. Because if he helps me, I help him. We help, like all of us want to basically pull our weight. And that's something I felt Bones could do an amazing job of. And he's even exceeded those expectations. We have some kids out there. You got to have some questions. Yeah, we got one over here. Did you ever have like a backup plan, or did you? Did you always just spike and like man, just kind of plan the PGA tour? Ah, oh man, the parents are not gonna like this answer. Uh, I, I didn't. I, I, I shouldn't say I didn't. I knew I was gonna do something in golf. Um, I'll never forget in any St. X people he, that are here. Um, I, I, I loved high school, going to school at St. X, and I was very close with a, with a handful of teachers, and I loved going back and visiting and seeing them. And, um, you know, our disciplinarian, Mr. Drury, was not a huge fan of me, uh, missing a lot of school for golf, and I'll never forget going back my first year as a professional. Um, you know, I'd gotten my Corn Ferry card, and I was out playing, and and I'm seeing everybody saying hello. I still so know some of the kids on the golf team, whatever. And um, and I run into him. And it was very nice not knowing that our conversation was going to end in a detention for me, but <laughs> just talking to him. And uh, and he's you know we're catching up. He's like, how's it going? Uh, he's like, well, how's college going? I was like, oh, I actually uh, I left. I only went to school two years. Um, he's like, really? He's like, did you transfer? I was like, no, I I went two years and uh, I left. A, to turn pro and play golf. He's like, well, you're going to go back and get your degree, right? And I was like, uh, not if I play good enough. No, I'm not going to. Like, I, and I'll never forget, he's just like, well, you have to. I'm like, you know what? You're not my teacher anymore. I don't have to take this from you. So I don't really want to talk to you about it. So um, to answer your question, golf was, I was always going to do anything and everything I could to be a professional golfer. And um and I mean, my parents will tell you that. A lot of my friends will tell you that. I missed out on a lot of things that a lot of high schoolers and, and college kids do. But to be honest, it, it sucked at the time. But right now, I don't really care. I mean, yeah, I would have loved to have a spring break in high school, but I would much rather win golf tournaments. Um, you know, I would, yeah, I would love to go and do a couple parties here. I would love to do a couple things there. But to me, golf was my life, and it was what I wanted to be the best in the world at and I knew that I was going to have to make some sacrifices so I kind of went all in on it a backup plan is not a bad thing yeah I, yeah <laughs> I, I advise, it's like I said I don't advise doing that but backup plans are good <laughs> how much how much time is, is spent outside of hitting golf balls as far as flexibility and weights and strength training yeah as you can see I lift quite a bit uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's when you're, I look at the poster on the putting green and I weighed 95 pounds when I was 16 years old. I only had one direction to go. So I, I, fitness is a huge part of my life now. I mean, especially in off weeks, I'm trying to take advantage of it as much as I can. But number one priority is always injury prevention. I mean, everything I'm doing is trying to make sure that I can play at a high level for as long as possible. I mean, golf is a very unique sport, you know, that you can, you can play at a high level at 45, 50, 55 years old. You know, the golf ball doesn't know how old you are. You don't necessarily need a crazy amount of speed. You don't need to be able to hit anybody or run fast. You just have to get in the hole quicker than anybody else. And so staying on top of my, my fitness and my just my overall health has been a, a definitely a massive priority of mine over the last three or four years. So like in an off week, how much, how many hours would you say it is in a week? I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing something I'd say at least five days a week. I mean, they're anywhere from an hour to two hours tops at a time. I mean, I, I like to, it just kind of depends on what we're working on. I mean, I have a lot of faith and trust in my trainer that he's in touch with my physio to say, you know, like this week, maybe his hips were or off or, or, you know, tighter than normal. So I, then we do a little bit more stretching and a little bit more stuff for my hips or Maybe my fatigue's a little bit low. Like this, these three weeks I've had off, I've really tried to build up my cardio and my stamina for these last three weeks, you know, to make sure we have some really hot conditions coming up and, and a big part of the year where a lot of guys could, 
potentially be you know losing energy and I don't want to be one of those people so it's one of those things where I'm I'm using these three weeks to my advantage of, of trying to make sure that I'm I'm peaking as the weeks go on as opposed to on the decline Mm -hmm. My golf ball doesn't know how old I am, but it knows I'm old. Because <laughs> it's starting to stick to my club face when I hit it. It just kind of bobbles off of it after the impact. You got it? Yeah, in the orange there. Um, how, how long have you been playing golf for? How old are you? I'm nine. You're nine? So at your age, I would have been playing golf for about seven years. Wow. Good math. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> There you go. So you'll you'll be up here then in uh, a little bit too. Give you give you twenty years. You'll be right here. Okay. <laughs> you can. Questions over here. Here we go. Uh, what does your like on course nutrition look like? like? How do you handle? I try to eat a good bit. I, I learned that um, for me, I used to not eat on the course. I don't know if it was like a nervous habit or if it was something where I just. I didn't feel like it or I wasn't hungry, but I learned that I, I just, I needed to because I would, uh, I would, I mean, hanger is a real thing, you know, I would, I would get hangry or I just would be irritable. So I'll have some kind of like either protein bars. I usually always have a sandwich, whether it's a peanut butter, banana, peanut butter and, uh, and jelly, grape jelly. Somebody asked me that earlier. I don't know who it was, but it's a great, yeah, grape jelly, not strawberry. Um, but yeah, it's something everybody again everybody's different but for me I, I need to keep something to keep fuel i mean it's it's similar to what i said earlier about the you know crashing late in the season it's the same with the round i mean you don't want to be loading up on sugar or, or anything like that in the middle of a round because you know those last call it four or five holes when some guys might be or girls might be going downhill you could be hitting your stride Um, well, I mean, the, the big check that they gave me when I went, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, the coach Sewell is like a, I mean, my parents are very comfortable with him. I mean, I, they would probably tell you too. He was, it was like a family type feel. I mean, it was, it was a good location in terms of going to college from home, but he just was, he made me feel welcome. He, he felt family. I feel like if I was in an emergency I could call him at one in the morning and he would be right there for me or I could or I could call him right now and he would drive to Louisville, Kentucky if I needed if he needed to. So I, I just I'm very, very um, I put a lot of emphasis, you know, on the on the trust and the just the closeness and, and friendship and, and Coach Sewell and, and all of his family have definitely they showed that to me and they and they still have. So I mean I, I made an unbelievable decision, but just kind of that for me, everybody's different in what they're looking for. I'm, I'm not really much of like a, you know, I, I don't need a dictatorship or someone that's going to boss me around. Yeah, I'm, you know, I was in college. I need slapped around every once in a while. But overall, I wanted him, his support and help more than anything. What's your favorite hole that you've ever played? Favorite hole I've ever played is the third hole at Wanamoiset Country Club. And you have no idea where that is, but you asked it, so I got you. Um, <laughs> it's a, just a short little par three with a green about the size of this table here that I played in a, an amateur event in when I was in college. Can you spell Wanna Moist it? <laughs> I can't either, so you're good. <laughs> it is in uh, Rhode Island? Yeah, Rhode Island. It's like right on the border there. It's close to Boston as well. Northeast Dan, yeah. Other than your uh, your dad and college coach, uh, who are the individuals who have had the greatest influence on your golf career? Uh, I mean, Tiger's had a huge impact on me. It's growing up in his prime and watching him on TV and, and wanting to do the things that he did on the golf course. Um, I mean, I've been fortunate to develop a lot of great relationships down in South Florida as well of, of other good players. And I, I mean, I could call them mentors a little bit. You know, Rory, Ricky, the, the, I mean, those guys that they went through a lot of things before I did that I felt like I could seek advice on to where when I got put in those positions before I would probably be ready, I was able to get advice and, and words of wisdom from them to where I was a little bit more comfortable when I got in those moments. So, I mean, a lot of guys I've been kind of like I said earlier, I'm a big question asker. So. If I can pick up one thing off of the 200th ranked player in the world that's going to help me, then 
that's fine. They, they don't have to be a you know a one or two ranked player in the world. I just I just want to get better. That's all I want to do. And um, there's a lot of guys down in South Florida that that are willing to do that. What's your advice for junior golfers? Advice for junior golfers that I would say to in like golf wise specifically, uh -huh. golf -wise. I would say to spend as much time on the chipping and putting green as you can because. Chipping and putting is the, is the most important part in golf, in my opinion. It's what separates every level, the, the junior level to the high school level, to college, and then the pros. Um, it's how you can start beating all your friends. It's it's probably going to be whoever wins ends up winning this tournament uh, this week is, is going to be the two people that chip and putt the best because nobody can frustrate your nothing can frustrate your opponent more than someone who has good chipping and putting and um, that's something that you can always work and you can never be too good at advice for good golf parents from golf both parents you and your dad. I mean I could I'll say what I think and then he I mean from my end from what both of my parents did of just letting me letting me go and letting me enjoy it and loving me the same no matter what I shot um, just you know always being there like my like my dad said you, you want to be a friend you know I think I've, you know, some of my friends are, are starting to have children now, and I can already just see how, how hard of a time I'm going to have, you know, stepping back at times, because I know you want to help help your kid, you want to help them succeed, but like I said to him earlier, if, if they're not enjoying it, it just doesn't matter how good they are at something, they're they're not going to want to keep doing it. So just to to be there when they want to, but you know, help them keep enjoying it, I guess. Yeah, I'll add. Uh... I mean, a couple of things that I always tell people is, you know, first and foremost, kids like to have fun. And I see a lot of parents making golf not fun for their kids. And so keep it fun and never talk about the negative things that happen. I think every parent's reaction is, you know, why, how did you three putt those three holes? Or I mean, what was that triple bogey that you made all about? They're, your child is well aware that they made a triple. You don't need to remind them. They're well aware that they three putted. You don't need to remind them. And they didn't try to do either of those things. So we kind of had a rule coming home from junior tournaments when he was little that as human nature would be, and Justin was like every other kid, he was hard on himself and would always want to talk about his failures and on the course that day whether he won or not he still would point out the bad shot he hit on 11 or whatever and we kind of developed a rule that all we would talk about was the good things that happened that day so uh, it's everybody's human nature to focus on the negative and i think it's really important that uh, they're aware of the negatives your role besides the financial role that you play is to make sure that you build them up because they do enough good they do a good enough job of tearing themselves down so you should be spending your time building them up not tearing them down further Oh, my shank? Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think. I was like, what did I do? When I, oh, my God. It was a, uh, yeah, a lateral, I believe it was. A hustle rocket, yeah. It was, that was a, yeah, that was a bizarre one. Um, I mean, that's one of those shots that's so bad, you, you just have to laugh. It's like, um, I mean, playing unbelievable golf right there, just coming off a birdie, like I have a chance to move up the leaderboard, felt great over a five iron and just shanked it. Um, I mean, again, there's nothing I can do about what happened in the past. You just, uh, Coach Saban at Alabama has a, a saying of be where your feet are, and that's, you know, you can't look forward, you can't look backward. You can only do anything, something about where you are at that time, and that's just kind of where I was at. I I had never planned on having 100 whatever yards for my second shot into a par three, but that's where we were at that time. So uh, And farther on your third shot. And even farther on my third shot. Um yeah, that was that was definitely the best bogey I've ever made, and um, and it was a nice one. But just making the that's kind of what I talked about earlier about just making the best out of a situation that you have, and there wasn't a whole lot I could do. There was nothing I could do about it at that point. I just had to try to salvage something. Ironically, correct me if I'm wrong. 
I think you had the same club on the next hole? Yeah, the same same yardage, same club on the next hole. And it was like we got out there, and I'm kind of, I mean, I get my yardages along with Bones, and I'm kind of writing it down, and I'm just like, I kind of look at him, and he's just like, yeah, same, <laughs> same, same yardage. I'm like, well, give me the five iron, let's give it another go. It's not I'm gonna, liking a hard six. Not going to be any worse. <laughs> Couple more. Yep, go ahead. How do you make sure you make the most out of your practice? That's a good question. Making the most out of your practice, it's I guess it, it in terms of like a practice day or a practice round. Or either or, or both. I think it's very specific as to what you're trying to work on. I mean I've I've definitely changed my practice days for what they used to be. It's it's, I, I'm trying to emulate a tournament condition as much as I possibly can. So I'm trying to make my practice as difficult as possible. I'm trying to make it as, um, as mentally exhausting as I can to where whenever I get out on the course in a tournament, it seems easy. You know, I'm, I'm and, and what I mean by that is, is doing performance-based stuff, you know, whether it's a, it's a putting drill and having to make 17 out of 20 from four to eight feet or doing uh, maybe a proximity drill of hitting, you know, hitting wedges 125 to 150 yards and trying to hit it in a certain width circle. It just, it's stuff like that to where if I don't give and give all of my undivided attention on each and every shot, then I'm not going to succeed. I, I want to, I want it to feel like when I'm out here, it's, it's like it is but easier on the golf course, if that makes sense. So there's, yeah, there's going to be times where you're working on stuff mechanically and that's where you're going to, you know, maybe need to take some more time and just kind of almost like rebuild your muscle memory. You know what I mean? If it's a swing change, whatever it might be, but as a whole, just trying to emulate the tournament circumstance and mindset as much as possible. So then when you get out there, it, you're just going through the motions and it's just golf. Yeah. So most all the drills that we do, both in our practice with him or what I do with my juniors when they come to see me, is they're all performance related. So we'll see where they're at fundamentally and so forth. And that's kind of what we would call more block practice where we're hitting a lot of balls. And we're less concerned about what the ball does and more concerned about are you getting more comfortable with what we're working on. As soon as we get to that comfort level, we immediately go into performance where whether you're putting, hitting balls, whether it's a driver, can't miss left, can't miss right drill, whether it's chipping and you got to reach a certain score or putting, everything is performance to where if you don't get to your baseline number, you start over. So it may take you 10 balls to get through it. It may take you 100 balls to get through it. So you're going to pay a lot more attention. And that's the, the, the pressure that we've, we want you to feel nerves in your practice. We want you to have some anxiety in your practice, knowing that if I don't make two of these last three, I gotta start this drill over. Well, I mean, whose fault's that? You know, did you pay enough attention on those first 15 putts? So everything is performance related. I would really encourage you to get into that type of practice. And something that's cool along with that is, and just happens to be all of y'all were provided with whoops, but like I, I wear my whoop and I have for a while and I will compare my heart rate to when I'm out in the tournament versus when I get done with a good practice session. And I, I'm trying to get those numbers as equal as possible. I'm trying to get when I'm out there practicing, trying to get my heart rate to 140, 150, just like I am when I'm trying to win a golf tournament. So that's something where you can use the information that you have to your advantage. Yeah. If you have an afternoon tea time and your normal wake up time is say six or seven o'clock, have enough time to go through your day and then do your normal workout and go uh, to the course. If you have an 8 a.m. tea time, do you just get up in time to do the golfing and do you get up much earlier than the normal thing you can do and kind of get acclimated to the day and then start? I mean, my, my routine is the same regardless of my tea time. I mean, I'm, I'm always going to see my physio depending on, depending on like, what the facilities are like or what the transportation's like you know there's weeks where we have to take shuttles to to ranges back yada yada and so i'm either going to see him an hour 45 or two hours before my tea time every single time so it doesn't matter if i play at 7 30 a.m or if i play at 2 30 p.m it's that's what i'm gonna do it just might be i'm having lunch before i see him or i'm having breakfast before i see him but 
No, I mean, I, um, what was it this year? I had it at, I had an alarm in the threes somewhere. Where was that? Uh, U.S. US Open? I don't know. It was miserable. I had, a, I had an alarm in the threes. I know I didn't, I didn't like that one very much, but for me too, if I'm not awake and I'm not going, um, it's just going to be kind of like a wasted day. It takes me 12 or 13 holes to get moving, so I need to do some kind of activation, some kind of body thing. You know, you kids, you don't get it yet. You know, when you get old, you'll understand like me. Um, but uh, just to get moving and, and get everything feeling normal, if you will. I haven't been activated since yeah. 98. <laughs> I thought there was a decent chance it was going to go in the water, but um, yeah, I like to think Grandpa bumped that one back in play for me. It was, it's a, I, I hate that tee shot to be perfectly honest. I mean, I absolutely hate it. It's just not a very comfortable one for me. When it was in May and it was really firm, I could kind of burn like a, a four iron or I used to use a two iron down there. But last year it was, it was a lot firmer than it has been in the past. So I was able to get a five wood up there pretty hard, but when I hit it hard like that, I, I hook it or over overturn it sometimes, and I overturned that one just a little bit, but um, I had about two yards of spare, so it wasn't really close in my eyes. <laughs> one more. With the playoffs coming up, what do you feel is dangerous? Oh, well, right now, it's, I mean, I'm going to be honest, it's pretty bad. I really haven't done very much, uh, but that's... That, I, for me, being in a good place mentally and, and physically uh, is, is just as important as my golf game being there. I mean, I, I never have three weeks off. I never have that amount of time off. So using the that first week completely away from the game, got into it a little bit last week, just kind of more fundamental stuff and just played. And then once I get back tomorrow, I'll really, really get into the specific practice, the, the performance type stuff, because it's... I mean, it's great to practice and kind of all, uh, and always work on little stuff here and there, but, you know, I, I, there's no need for me to go put five, six, seven hour days in last week because I wasn't competing for another two weeks. And there's nothing, we're not in any kind of like swing revamp, we're not in anything like that. It's really just kind of maintenance and trying to keep it in a, in a very tight, small window. So, you know, he's going to come this, this next or this weekend and we're going to get some work in and, and we'll be ready come Thursday in Memphis. Thank you all again, again. so much. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And again, thank you for all the sponsors. We look all this all, all the juniors play well. Best of luck. And if anybody has to play with Dan Sullivan, uh, oh, yeah, he stinks down there. He's bad. <laughs>